Oh, I mean, I've been wanting to come to Morocco for a long time. Uh, I've heard just nothing but the best things. And uh, so on a personal level, I was very excited. And everything I'd heard and seen about the festival here, it just seemed like just something completely out of this world that is on another level when it comes to just the scale and, you know, the the, the amazing, talented artists that come here. Um, so I was so excited for that. And then, you know, when it comes to sharing the film with the Moroccan audiences, that part I was really nervous about. Um, this is the first time we're sharing a film with uh, an audience that's not either North American or Korean. And so... You know, I was, I was, I was, I was curious ha whether you know some of the, the, some of the certain elements of the story, some of the relationships, some of the themes would translate. Um, and when we had the screening yesterday, I was very nervous, and it was incredibly quiet. And you know, when we when we screen in North America, some of the jokes, some of the humor is very specific to North America and of that time. So I think people people relate to it on a different level. And so it's, it was a different kind of energy, but, you know, yesterday's audience, especially because I'm, like, the theater's so big, and I'm in the front, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't really gauge. And I thought, oh, God, I think people are not liking it. And then about 20 minutes into the movie, I hear this older gentleman to my left. I just hear this. <laughs> and I thought, oh, God. The whole theater is falling asleep. <laughs> and, and I'm just sitting there going like, oh, God, this is going terribly. And then, but then once it ended and, and you know, you could feel the, 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 the reaction. And it, um, maybe that gentleman had a, a breathing problem and <laughs> maybe he wasn't snoring. But, uh, yeah, no, it seemed really great. And I was, you know, I spoke to a lot of the audience members after the screening. And um, interestingly enough, a lot of younger men seem to be quite moved by the story, uh, which is different than some of the other screenings we've had uh, in other countries. So, yeah, no, it's really fun. It's really interesting. I call it semi-autobiographical in that, yes, I grew up in the grew up in Vancouver in the 90s. And, um, you know, the main thing that I would say is based on me is the really the the journey of you know at first struggling to assimilate and coming to terms with my own um, identity as a Korean Canadian person um, struggling to understand you know what is my culture wanting to fit in but not quite fitting in Canada as, as an outsider and then going back to Korea and being called a foreigner there and being you know different there as well and just trying to find who I am and, and, and having to look sort of inward and, and, and learn about myself through learning about my family, learning about my roots, um, and learning about my own dad, you know, after he passed away. And so that part is what's really the most autobiographical. The details, you know, a lot of it exaggerated, elaborated, and dramatized to turn it into a, you know, an interesting movie. <laughs> No, I, I wouldn't say I was. I wasn't trying to make. Uh, I wasn't trying to make some kind of a statement or message about, you know, misogyny or racism of that part of the world during the '90s. I wanted to tell a story about a mother and son struggles finding their place in this new world, but it seemed like it would be dishonest to leave those things out because those things were such a big part of their journey and them discovering themselves and, and how it affected, you know, their growth as individuals and, and as a family. Um, because, yeah, I mean, it's, at least in North America, we've come a long way in 30 years when it comes to, you know, acceptance of other cultures, um, the, the words we use, you know, there's a lot of words we use back then to describe other people or to insult other people that, whether it be gender or race, that we can't use, we don't use now. Um, but we can't pretend like it didn't happen back then. And we can't, I felt like we couldn't put, you know, cha rewrite history and put our today's moral standards on the past. Because it was different then. We thought, acted, 
spoke differently than we do now. And so I want to be honest about that, you know, but that's not what the movie's about ultimately. Oh, I'm a lazy editor. <laughs> no, I did feel like that when I was editing. I'm like, oh, did I just do this to make my job easier? But no, what it was was um, one of the one of the early decisions that my uh, director of photography, Christopher Liu, and I had to make was deciding on whose perspective is this story going to be told from. And because even in the writing stage, I didn't write this film as though it was from the mother or the son's perspective. And so we agreed, and we both came to the conclusion separately too, that we thought, it feels like the story is being told from the perspective of the deceased father. And so we went, okay, let's go with that. And so if it's, the movie starts with the narration by the father, it doesn't explicitly say that it is. The audience isn't expected to know that. It doesn't really matter whether they know it or not. But for us, at least, to decide on what the visual approach was going to be, we agreed that that's what it would be. And so as a result, we wanted the camera to feel as though it was another person that wasn't seen. You know, not a, I don't want to say a ghost, but, you know, as though it's a spirit that the characters can't see. But it is present in that room and it is observing in real time with a specific emotional relationship to the characters in the scene. And so that informed everything for us. Where we were going to place the camera, how it was going to move, when it's going to move, uh, the speed in which it's going to move. Um, so that it, these weren't just arbitrary decisions we were making but that it was from an emotion from an emotionally specific place um and so it made sense for it to you know feel like we're just the audience is experiencing these moments from a non-judgmental observational approach and that the audience isn't being manipulated into feeling an emotion you know there's there's like what you see is what you get the performers are really experiencing these emotions, are really hearing and saying these things. I'm not chopping it up in post to make it something else, that it's almost like a documentary, you know, in the sense that it just, it's actually happening. So if you, the audience, feel that happening for yourself, great. And if you don't, that's fine too. But you, the audience, get to make your own decisions, you know, get to have your own you know, subjective experience of these scenes. Michael Jordan, I'm dead. When did Davis not dead? Davis, Tony, and Gatana? Shut up, that Michael Jordan. Taran didn't pull up. But it's an up, Michael Jordan. I'm dead. Taran go pull up. Taran go shut up, Michael Jordan. Could a crowman, Michael Kim, who I'm in Jordan Kim Hadonga. Could they shut up, Michael Jordan? Michael Jordan, I'm not going to die. 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 I'm not going I grew up loving movies, and the movies I grew up loving were of the, you know, 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, and they were all shot on film, because digital films and digital movies didn't exist back then. So, you know, growing up and just, just thinking, oh, if I ever got to make my own movies, you know, for my own personal selfish reasons, I wanted, I wanted to look and feel like the movies I grew up watching and loving. And so I have a certain affinity to celluloid to begin with. But then with this film, I wanted the experience of watching this film to be like looking through your childhood photo album. You know, when you look at your own baby photos and stuff like that, there's a, there's a nostalgia to it and there's a charm to it 
but they're not perfect. You know, a lot of them, they're, you know, some photos, unless your parents were, like, expert photographers, a lot of them, they're, they're imperfect. They, you know, sometimes they're out of focus. Sometimes they're, the framing's not great or it's overexposed or underexposed. Um, but that's all kind of what makes them special. And, 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 and those photos are just one of one. And so I wanted the f movie to feel like that. And so we looked at a lot of different film options, but 16 millimeter film ha just seemed to be the right balance of everything we were going for. Um, and then, so then, you know, knowing that we were shooting on film and knowing we have a finite amount of it, we had to be really specific of how we were shooting um, and prepare and, and, and rehearse a lot. We rehearsed the actors a lot, but we also rehearsed with the, the DP. And we shot a lot of the scenes on our, on our iPhone. You know, with the, there's this app you can, choo you can have where you can choose the camera and the lenses that you're using. So it mimics it so that we got a sense of what it would feel like, what it would look like. And then all the crew can reference it and know exactly how we're shooting this thing so everyone can plan for it. Um, and so, yeah, it was extremely uh, uh, carefully planned and choreographed. But then, because we prepared so much that on the day... You know, I also gave the actors and the and a camera operator and the focus puller the freedom to act from their instincts and, and to be spontaneous in the moment if need be. Um, because I didn't want it to also feel overly polished. I didn't want it to feel perfect. I, w I did want it to feel like the photos in our photo albums. I, I did want it to have a certain amount of, you know, a... a, a, a an organicness to it, a, a sense of that it's the film is the movie is living in the moment, um, and imperfect. Because I, I I I like that. I you know it's like it's like looking at paintings, where, you know you can see like you can see the human touch, you can see the imperfections, and that's what makes it so magical. It's that like, it's you see it in person. You go, this wasn't created by a, a god or you know a bunch of witches. It was created by a human being with hands and eyes and, you know, a mind just like me. And you can see the process all right there on that canvas. And that's, that, that to me is like a, what a, a great um, film is. There's a handful of films that I shared with my cast and crew, which I said, you must watch these to get a sense of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, the films in particular that I'll, I'll mention are uh, Peppermint Candy by Lee Chang Dong, which, you know, it, it, it shows a certain, uh, the similar timeline of Korea, um, which I thought was really important for people to see so they could get a sense of the visual, some of the, the backstory, um, some of the emotional range that we also want to explore. Um, I also shared a film called Dust in the Wind, by Ho Xiao Shen. Um, it's just one of my favorite movies, and, and it's it's a very simple, simple story, but it's a beautiful story about you know a young boy and girl and their and their love and their relationship over many many years, and the framing and, and it also used I mean, Ho Xiao Shen is also just famous for use you know using long takes, and so that was a really good reference that we used. Um, and another film called Happy as Lazaro, which is probably the is the most recent film of those three um which i think is just w one of the best films i've seen in the, the last several years and um the the, the camera moves the lighting that just there's a there's a real rawness to it um that i love and that i wanted to kind of you know bring some of that flavor into our film as well